Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank um, you, guys. Really appreciate the uh, opportunity to be here uh, with you all at Slush. Um, so I'm Peter Weed, and, and this is Gisa. Uh, Hello. I am no longer have the, uh, the pleasure of being at McKinsey. Uh, I am now a venture capitalist. Um, but uh, we thought that we'd come and share a little bit of what we were seeing and learning. And For sure. When we had the opportunity to found this practice at McKinsey four or five years ago, the thing that had really struck me is that when I did the research uh, with a few other colleagues, we saw that there had been 5,000 companies approximately in the software world that had made it to 50 million in revenue since 1980. But of those, only about 400 ever survived to be standalone businesses by 500 million in revenue. And we asked ourselves, what gives? Those companies, when you make it to 50 million in revenue, do you think you can even make it to 10 million in revenue with a crappy product? That means there were 5,000 amazing product companies out there, of which the vast majority, over 90% of them, never survived to actually impact the world. And I was asking myself, why does it have to be that way? Could we even get 100 more of those companies? And what would the world be different if we were able to achieve that? And so we took all of that research and we started working with a bunch of the uh, leading venture capital firms out of the US initially and then expanded globally, um, uh, exploring that. You can do this in a ton of different technology categories. It's hard to have a really broad conversation, so we're going to focus today. We're going to talk about what we discovered looking at SaaS businesses and how we break them apart uh, and how we have an opinion, at least, on how you can metric and, and evaluate those businesses. Is it going to be perfect? No. This is a dialogue. We want to hear from you guys and, and, and participate in this. This is about pushing forward um, the capabilities of, of what's going on. But at, at the highest level, and this is just like, look, we started to top down along. saying, you know, what drives value? You know, how do you actually metric for that? And how do you run these businesses? But this was the, the, the culmination of that initial work. And we've got a whole set of stuff called Grow Fast, Die Slow, where we actually take a look at the scaling of these businesses, right? What do you want to look at at a business by the time you get to 5 to 10 million in revenue to say, by the time that I double a couple more times, make it to 50 million, I've got a very high probability of succeeding. And in the end, the answer is actually pretty simple. You have to outgrow your competitors. In fact, the, in um, the world of software, it tends to be a winner-take-all scenario. So one company survives. On average, it's not in this deck, but on average, that number one company, if you look, we've done three-year cohorts going back 20 years. On average, that number one company consumes 70 to 75% of the total equity of that entire space. And if you have that amount of equity, you can raise money more cheaply and you can buy other companies more cheaply. So it puts you in a position of power, and that's why you see this. 51% of all software companies that reached 50 million in revenue that were growing greater than 50% per year through 100 and 150 million in revenue, they lasted and became $500 million companies. It was a de minimis number. There were very, very few companies that actually maintained their standalone status that were not growing at least 50% per year. In fact, it's, it's, it's so clear uh, in the numbers that that is what you're looking for. And so we're going to talk a little bit about how do you actually get there. And by the way, the, the challenge that you're facing with all of this is you're probably burning money to grow 100, 200% up to 50, because that's kind of what you need to do. And at 50, you need to be growing 50% a year through 150. You're probably burning cash. And you're doing it in the constraints of a market that may be valuing your money differently, your equity differently, right? This at is just moments in time, lo obviously. looking back the last three or four years at the valuation of SaaS on revenue multiples. It's all over the map, right? And if you delay fundraising or you raise less money than you should, and you're making choices to grow more slowly, that puts you in a position where you are very likely to be surpassed by somebody else. So it's not just growth, it's efficient growth. And it frustrated the hell out of me because two or three years ago we would do all these things and valuations were purely built on essentially growth rate. 
I'm happy that over the last year, I think people have been listening to us, and now you get about 25% of the valuation is actually driven by the efficiency of that growth. And so let's talk about, like, how would you actually metric and look at a business to actually um, uh, do that in such a way that's operationally feasible? Yeah, exactly. So at least we've now arrived at this you know, idea of efficient growth as opposed to just growth at all costs. But now the next problem kind of kicks in, right? How do you actually measure that? And what comes with this is that there is a multitude of metrics out there that people use to assess growth, right? I mean, you can see a, a short list on this page, um, but there's many more. My personal favorite, for example, is the famous infamous rule of 40, which tries to hone in on the relationship between top line growth and margin development. And effectively, what it's saying is, uh, you know, revenue growth combined with um, your EBITDA margin has to equal 40. In other words, if you're growing, you know, 20% year on year, then you should see a margin in your business of another 20%. Conversely speaking, if you're growing at 80%, you can afford to have a negative margin of 40%, right? So there's a couple of issues that come with this notion, for example. So one of them, you know, it's not scientifically founded. Two, and that, you know, how sustainable is a business that's growing extensively, top line only, but there's no profit coming out of it. Um, and then three, what do you actually do with this? Even if this holds, it doesn't allow you to dig deeper. It doesn't allow you to actually understand what it is operationally that you can do in order to drive growth further. And so this is where, you know, where we've spent a lot of time thinking about, okay, well, you know, if you think about these metrics and if you think about what to measure, how to measure, and then how to actually dig deep in your business, what we propose is a slightly different concept. And it's centered on what we've dubbed two kinds of engines. You can see them on this page. On, you know, on the left side, there's what, we've called, what we call the cash engine. And we've separated that from what's on the other side here, which is effectively the growth engine. You know, very, very briefly, what that means is on the left side, you see everything that's kind of you see the operational value of your business. This is all about how much free cash you can generate from one dollar of ARR you know, that's coming in. So you take out, you, know, you start with your gross margin, you take out COGS, you take out um, G&A, and more importantly, you take out R&D. That's, that's an important call out because we would argue that R&D is essential to your business. You need to spend money on R&D to drive growth further. And then what you're left with is effectively your net margin, right? Your cash, the cash engine of your business. On the other side, it's more around how do you effectively spend your money, right? How much net new ARR are you driving with every dollar that you're spending uh, on your sales and marketing campaigns? And what's the beauty or the advantage of this model and why the reason why we like it is that it actually can be built down or treat down to a very granular level, right? To very actionable operating metrics that allow you, if you're on the very right-hand side of this, you know, if, of this decision to your chart, to really understand what it is, what's the one single metric, what's the one single criterion that you can you know, modulate, that you can work on in order to improve your business and ultimately drive growth. Having looked at you know, dozens of businesses that way, what we found is that there's really in SaaS, there's really four areas um, where you can create growth, right? The first four places to look, if you will. Um, you can see them on this page. It's, there's, there's an element around recurring margins, of course. There is an element around customer acquisition on the opposite end of that. There's pricing, which kind of feeds into both. And then there is your customer success. Um, let me quickly talk you through, you know, we're a consultancy, we, we love to calculate things. So we've, you know, we've taken a, an example growth stage SaaS business, and we've tried to really assess, well, if you think about these four areas of success, right, and how they tie back to these operating metrics, where is it that you can create, where can you create the most bang for your buck, right? Where do you go first? 
And so what we found is, and this is again, this is a standard business, you know, $20 million ARR, you know, 100% ARR growth rate. You can see the assumptions on the left side here. Point is that, you know, for your free cash flow out of those four areas, the two that are most effective for you to look at immediately are on customer acquisition and pricing. And Peter is going to talk about this for a moment in terms of what we've, in a moment, in terms of what we've, how we've applied this and what we've found with one particular company that we've worked with a lot in the past. Um, but what is really interesting here also, just as a side note, is a lot of people tend to focus on the retention element of this. Um, and it turns out that, yes, you know, it's, it's obviously it's important that you maintain your customers. But if you want to drive your business forward, like there's other areas that you need to target first, right? Pricing is usually a pretty easy one and one that you should immediately kind of evaluate, followed by customer acquisition um, features. And so, Peter, do you want to talk us through a little bit on how we've applied this? Yeah, I mean, look, th this is just numbers, right? The beauty of this is it actually transitions from metrics that tend to be very backward looking, tend to be very inconsistently yeah. defined, tend to be not linked to operational activities you can do. This is a little bit like, you know, playing football and telling, being told to play harder, right? You know, you don't want to do that because you don't know what to do. Even though the every football team is yeah. told that. The beauty of this <laughs> is you can actually start to prioritize different activities that, that you might take uh, in a business. And an example of that, um, a few years ago, we had the opportunity to work with a really neat uh, cybersecurity company. And when I started the conversation with the CEO, he was in a situation where he had seen hyper growth up to about 25%, and then he'd hit a wall. He was growing at about 25 to 30% per year. He really believed that he needed to grow much more quickly. And he was struggling with why was this situation occurring. And when we looked at his sales force, he had 18 salespeople and only two were hitting their quota number. So we were talking about, well, what do you do about this? And his initial instinct was, holy cow, I've hired a, a lot of really bad salespeople. I'm going to try to fire all these folks. And it's just operationally almost impossible to turn over a whole sales force and, and actually continue your growth. And we basically said, let's calm down. Let's actually get to know this business a little bit more. And let's, let's break, break it down in, into its underlying um, structures and ask, like, what's actually happening here? When we started to piece it apart, you saw something that's very common. I see this all the time in businesses, which is to have maximized their TAM up front and to have a very simple way of talking about things, they had had a very horizontal value prop. The challenge is, is that horizontal value prop wasn't resonating with any customers. They didn't know exactly who they were trying to sell to, and they were trying to sell to everybody. By actually doing one small little tweak, which was we actually segmented the customer base into five different groups and actually created pitch decks specifically for those, within two quarters, every one of their salespeople but one was exceeding their quota. And then the beauty was they had created you know, a sales team that was like a little bit of a bunch of mini-me's of the original like good sales mm -hmm. guy. Um, well, over time, you need to diversify the sales organization. You need to add BDRs. What are you going to do about hunting versus farming? Do you handle enterprise sales the same as, as uh, mid-market sales? The sales team now was actually really happy, as you can imagine, six months in. So when you went in and actually announced, hey, we're going to reorganize how this team works on our growth path to adding, getting up to 35 salespeople, they were happy to actually adopt that. And then that puts you in a position where you could actually, in their, their particular case, you also saw, by the way, when, you, when you're screwed up on your customer segmentation and your value prop, your pricing is screwed too, because there's no way you could have had pricing right if those things were, were screwed up. Well, now your sales team's actually performing at, high, uh, at a high uh, basis. You can actually change pricing and actually see the results come out of it. And so in their particular case, pretty much every six months, they did one, they pulled one lever and in a period of two years, they went from about 25 million ARR to 110 million ARR. And they sold um, earlier this year for 635 million, which I know the CEO and I were a little frustrated because essentially their cap table was just so excited. They'd gone from something that was almost looking like a recap to having a huge exit. So they were like so excited to, to get the money. Um, we, we could have probably doubled or tripled the business um, a couple more times. But the point is, is even if you find yourself in those scenarios where you're seeing that top off, which so many businesses have, and we have these charts that we call the valley of death, which is 
it just happens all the time between 10 and 50 million in revenue, you can reignite it because almost always it has nothing to do with your product. It has everything to do with how you actually operate that business. And putting yourself in a position where you actually move from being just a great product company to being a great operating company is the key. Because that's what's going to create the durable value and not have the brutality that allows you to be a standalone giant and doesn't put you in a scenario where you have to sell out early just for people and IP value. So anyways, we'll, we'll stop there. And I know that uh, we also wanted to do some Q&A uh, from the audience. And please come up and talk to Gisa and I afterward. I mean, I've worked with a few hundred businesses and uh, a few dozen of the top venture funds pretty deeply over the last four to five years scaling their businesses. There's just so many really common opportunities that unlock uh, hyper growth for businesses and help them achieve uh, you know, their outcomes they're, they're looking for. Yep. Uh, about four minutes to answer a couple of questions. Maybe pick one or two uh, from Slido that you can see in front Let's of you. Let's do it. We're screen. ready. Okay. What resource? Okay. Do you think that apart from knowledge, the growth is about luck? <laughs> <laughs> I've heard someone say to me once, "Luck means you know getting up early in the morning." So. Um, I think there is some component of it, but I really think it's more scientifically driven than that. I don't know if you want to. Well, I mean, I think what you're saying about luck is did I stumble upon knowing my customer segments yeah. and get lucky about figuring out how to actually target my product? Can you get lucky and do that? Yeah, but most of the businesses that I've observed and worked with that have actually gone on to have pretty successful IPOs, it was actually from moving from a perspective that they were going to be lucky to one where they actually took control of their destiny. Because if you're in that scenario where you're relying on being lucky, you essentially are just hoping that the outcome is going to occur. And look, a lot of that is occurring in the kind of pre-product market fit world. But in the post-product market fit world, you actually have the tools at your disposal where you can actually affect the chances that you actually have an outcome. It, there's so many case studies, and I hate to call out individual companies, so we can talk about it later. But you know, I think s some of the, the great examples are folks like Twilio, you know, making their pivot from um, you know trying to sell 23 visionary value props that was evangelical sales hell to having like three very specific things they were selling to people that wanted to buy today. You know, it's things like that that it essentially transform your business and allow you to take control. And Roy, the guy who who helped do that, you know, he, he, he did an amazing job, you know. So you can talk about tons of these. Almost all the success cases look like that. They don't look like luck. Okay, where can I find the data you presented? Well, <laughs> uh, in come see us after. Uh, McKinsey proprietary data, happy to talk to you about, you know, what, what our findings are, what we've done in, on the analytical front to, to come, you know, create these to come to these insights and create these charts. Um, it's basically, it's, you know, our, our in-house research, Peter and my experience over the last, you know, decade or so in working with tech, uh, technologically um, enabled, you know, fast growing companies. Yeah, it, and Gisa, I, the, the entire team um, is built of folks that have been entrepreneurs and in the venture community. So you, you were at Summit yep. Partners before. Most of the folks on our team, you know, ran other very successful um, startups or, or venture funds prior to coming back. Um, we've benchmarked uh, over 200 growth stage SaaS companies. So a lot of this comes out of directly there. Plus, we've worked with portfolios of a few hundred um, SaaS companies from a number of different venture funds to directly look at much of this. So the data is real when you look at uh, these companies and how you can actually compare yourself to them. Do you think there's a certain sign that a company would fail? Um, you know, the failures that, that I have seen actually most frequently come from businesses where they don't end up understanding who their customers actually are and what they want to do and how they want to buy. And, and trying to be, I think, everything for everyone rather yeah, yeah. than doing a proper kind of customer segmentation, right? And understanding that there's different elements, different you know, buckets, if you will, of, of people that you cater to. It's not one size fits all. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I always go on the, the, the mantra that if you're building a platform, you've already lost. Because anybody yeah. who builds a platform isn't building something for anyone. 
the best companies that have platforms never built a platform. They built for very specific solution cases. And they you know, expected that they were going to be selling those specific things. And th those actually helped them be very successful and actually scale those, um, those businesses. So anyways, I, I know that we're out of time. You know, please come up afterward and we can talk about sure, right. more very specific Thank case you. studies. Thank you, McKinsey Thank and you. Peter and Jesus. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Let's give a big hand. Thank you.